Okay, so let's, uh, as, the, as we always say, let's get into it. There's something weird going on here with my computer. Okay, so here are the top, uh, top yeah. <laughs> I've even created a tongue twister for myself. Top 10 Takeo troubleshooting tech tips. <laughs> there you go. So what what are they? Well, the first one is identify the problem. Interview the customer and the technician or the technician, which sometimes is the same person. Request a piping diagram or sketch. Assemble manufacturer's data. Collect field data. And we have what is known as commercial pump, pump troubleshooting report. I'm going to show you what that looks like. And hopefully when Brett gets around to it, we can uh, make it a handout this evening. Uh, let me know if you got that uh, handout, by the way, Brett. I, I got it, so I'm trying to add, upload it now. Okay, great. Um, we always like to request photographs, and we like to request videos uh, whenever we're doing troubleshooting. And uh, we like to analyze the data. And after we analyze the data, we may request additional data. And then the 10th tip is recommend a solution. Okay, so you may wanna take a snapshot of this or a screen save while I'm chatting here. We are going to go through a, uh, an Apple actual troubleshooting issue that came up about, I think it's about three or four weeks ago. And this is a, an actual problem that we were faced with, and I'm going to take you through, and this was on a pumping system. So I'm going to take you through step-by-step step with each one of these 10 uh, techno tips. Techo tips? Tech tips. Yeah. Well, there you go. And, uh, we'll, st and we'll, we'll solicit questions at, uh, at each, of the, uh, each of the different pieces that we go through so you can sort of see how we uh, figured out what was going on with this particular problem. So uh, before we get into it, uh, oh, and the other thing is that we are also going to uh, have some bonus material at the end of the uh, troubleshooting tech tips part. And so those of you that want to hang around a, a little bit later, uh, we can go into some of the other topics that are on the list that uh, we put together for this broadcast. So, how do we identify the problem? Well, we know we have a problem. And uh, as you can see, the cartoon we have here, Houston, we have a problem. You can see Santa Claus is measuring the opening of the chimney, and uh, Rudolph is indicating that perhaps he may not fit. So, how do we actually identify the problem? We, we ask, that the, usually these uh, problems come in on an email and they're usually very cryptic and they, they type in and they say, uh, Rich or Brett or Mario or anybody that's uh, uh, doing some of this troubleshooting stuff is they send us a very cryptic email and say, hey, we have a, a problem on a project. We're not getting uh, what we expect to be getting. Can you help us out? So the very first thing you have to do is identify, as I said, that's the first tech tip, is identify what the problem is. And it's as simple and straightforward as asking the question, what is the problem? And in this particular example, we're gonna be have a solve a pump problem this evening. We have a flow problem. It's as simple and straightforward as that. Now we don't know what is causing the flow problem, all we know is that the customer is concerned because they have some type of flow problem. They don't know if it's the pump or the system or the combination of the two, or is it some kind of control issue? No idea. All we know is that we have a flow problem. So now that we've identified the problem, the very next thing we should do is have some kind of interview. And I like to conduct those interviews on the phone call up the customer or the technician and start asking some questions. So we get them on the phone and the first thing I like to find out is uh, what type of pump are we talking about? So I say, you know, tell me a little bit about the system. I say, well, they, we've got an end suction pump and it's a model FI5009D as in David. I said, well, okay, that sounds good. Uh, what else can you tell me about it? Well, it's a condenser water system. Oh, okay. Is it an open system or is it a closed system? And generally speaking, 
when it comes to uh, most, not all, but most condenser water systems or open systems. And in this particular project that I had to do some troubleshooting on, it was in fact an open cooling tower system. So that's what they told me, open cell cooling tower. So Rich, so, uh, we have a great question. Uh, uh, could you yeah. t t tell me what uh, t someone's asking, what does that mean, open cell? Oh, excellent question. So uh, there are two major categories of cooling towers uh, for condenser water systems. One is known as an open cell, which means that it's open to the atmosphere. The water that it's exposed to the atmosphere that's used for evaporation and rejecting heat is the same exact water that runs through the condenser water pump into the chiller for rejecting heat in the building. A closed cell cooling tower is one where the water that's circulating through the condenser water loop is not open to the atmosphere. It uh, is sealed off, it's a closed loop pressurized system, and then we use a separate, a separate water circulating loop for evaporating the water. So the cooling tower itself typically has a heat exchanger that's closed to the atmosphere embedded inside of it. It's like a giant radiator and then we have a separate water circulating system that the, sprays the water over the top of that heat exchanger, and then the air is drawn through and exhausted so that the air, the water that's evaporating does not come in contact with the condenser water pump, and that's a closed loop pressurized system. But for this discussion, the troubleshooting is all about an open cell cooling tower system. Hopefully that answers the question, Brett. I'm sure it did, and by the way, um, uh, from what I can tell, the handout is available for folks to uh, download. Oh, good, because so I'm going to. I'll, I'll, be, I'll describe that handout, and I'll uh, yep. in a few minutes we'll go through that. So we're going to continue the interview. I said, okay, it's an open cell cooling tower. It's a condensed water system. I understand the mo pump model, and I understand that it's uh, obviously an end suction pump. What is the design flow? And they tell me, well, it's a thousand gallons per minute. And what is the pressure differential for the design? It has a design head of 50 feet. Okay, so now I've got some information. I can write it down. Um, and I, I generally jot this information down on a pad of, yeah, on a pen, yeah, with a pen. How do you say pen and pad of paper? <laughs> <laughs> you can, After you can seven, it. I don't know how to do it. Yeah, I was just gonna say, you can tell it's getting, it's getting late because, uh, it's like Peter Piper picked a pack of uh, pads of paper or whatever. Anyway, okay. Now that's the design condition. I said, okay, now I understand the design condition. I understand the basics of the system, but what is actually happening? You say you have a flow problem. And they say, well, we have a very accurate flow meter that was calibrated before installation. It has 15 pipe diameters upstream of the flow meter, 10 pipe diameters downstream of the flow meter, and it's connected on a straight run of pipe. It's an Onicon meter. Um, it's very accurate, and we're measuring we're measuring um, actual measured flow of 500 gallons per minute, and we're measuring the pressure differential across the pump at the design pressure differential. I'm sorry, but the actual measured head is uh, 60 feet. 60 feet. Wow, that doesn't make any sense. So okay, so let's take a look at it and. Uh, so the next thing I ask for is send me a diagram. So here's a very simple diagram. This is one of the tips that I listed earlier. So send me a sketch or a diagram of what this system is all about. And so I'll continue the conversation. I'll say, okay, I see your system here uh, in a diagram. I'm going to grab a pen here. Let's see if I can grab a pen. I said, okay, so the first thing, this is an open cell cooling tower. That means that the water that goes into the cooling tower that's being circulated in this condenser water system, let's see, can I draw a straight line? Yeah, I can draw a straight line. Okay, so the water is flowing this way. It actually goes into the cooling tower, and this is called the hot deck up here. And this is open to the atmosphere. There we go. And the water trickles down like this, trickles down. And while the water trickle, trickles down through what is known as the fill, the air is the fan is at the top. There's the fan right there. And the air is drawn over that water and causes it to evaporate. And when that happens, the water drops in temperature as a function of the wet bulb temperature. 
Oh, looks like we have a typo here, Brett. Sorry about that. This is supposed to be 85 degrees. Uh -huh. I'll write that in there. 85 degrees. Okay. So this is the sketch that they sent me. And the first question I ask is I said, okay, it's an open cell cooling tower. What's the elevation of the water level inside the cooling tower basin relative to the center line of the pump? In other words, what is this vertical distance from here to here? Uh, I'll just draw a line. This line represents the connection for the center line of the pump. So what is that dimension from there to there? And they say, oh yeah, Rich, we, uh, we actually did measure that for you. And it turns out that that elevation is four feet. So you can see I'm starting to collect all kinds of cool information here. And they said they had a pressure gauge on the suction side of the pump, and they have another pressure gauge on the discharge side of the pump, and they have a flow meter. Um, and that's that flow meter I was talking about. So they're measuring the flow. Now, obviously, this diagram is not to scale because they had plenty of pipe length before and after the flow meter so they could measure the flow accurately. And they're only getting 500 gallons per minute. So there in lies, we're still trying to figure out what's going on. Okay, so we've collected some information. Before I go any further, any questions about some of the information that I've collected? No, well, just a statement. Uh, uh, our good friend Jim, who uh, made a lot of statements last week, two weeks ago, have they bumped it to verify correct rotation? Should be one of the first questions he might suggest. <laughs> yeah, actually, that was one of the questions that I was uh, I was going to cover. So yep. yes, the uh, rotation. So that's a very important thing. <clears throat> ah, rotation. So we want to make sure that they've checked the rotation that the pump is rotating properly. Now it turns out that our end suction pumps, when we viewed from the motor side, should be rotating in the clockwise direction. And we'll see that in the photograph in a minute. Did I just lie about that, Brett? No, I don't think so. Okay. No. Nope. So that's our basic diagram. And uh, so that's what they first sent me. They sent me this basic diagram and I understood what was going on. I said, I might have some more questions about this diagram a little bit later, but let's continue along here. And I said, uh, the next piece of the next tip that I'm interested in is, let me just go back here. Okay. Yeah, here is the, uh, the manufacturer's data. Okay, so we know it's an end suction pump. We know it's an FI509D. And here are the pump details. It's uh, pumping 1,000 gallons per minute. This was the original design conditions, by the way, 1,000 gallons per minute, 50 feet of head, 1760 RPM. Look at the impeller diameter, 8.3 inches. It's a six by five pump, and that was kind of important to understand that it was six by five. Six by five tells me that the inlet side here, ah, where's my pen? What happened to my pen? The inlet side, of this pump is six inches and the outlet is five inches. And if you notice, you can barely see it in the background. See that arrow right there? That means that the direction of rotation is in this direction, which means when you're viewing it from the uh, motor end from this side here, it should be rotating clockwise because when you view it from the suction side, it's actually rotating counterclockwise, but the actual rotation should be clockwise. And I, I don't think there's an exception to that. I think, uh, Brett, you can help me with this, but I think all of our end suction pumps, when viewed from the motor end, rotate clockwise. Actually, I'm sure. going to ask uh, Mario. Mario, uh, Mario, you're listening to this. You're going to mute yourself, and you can confirm that, or you can... Or we can type okay. it in. So it's because this is takeo after dark and it's kind of an informal presentation. Mario can say I'm a liar. That's okay too. Did Mario uh, type in anything? Not yet. Uh, he probably uh, is watching the football game. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's look at some more manufacturers' data. Mar um, Mario just typed in. Yes, you are correct. Yes, that's the first uh, first correct. Oh, let's look at a couple of other quick things. By the way, if you'll notice. 
under the design conditions, it should be consuming about 14.74, about 14 and three quarter horsepower. And the non-overloading horsepower should be just over 15 horsepower. Um, and so as part of my data collection, it should have been equipped with a 20 horsepower motor. And I, I went back and I spoke to the, uh, uh, the folks on the site and I actually had them take a photograph of the nameplate on the pump and on the nameplate on the motor. And it was in fact a 20 horsepower motor. So that was a good piece of information. Okay, so let's look at the pump curve itself. Um, let me erase this fun stuff here. There we go. And here's the uh, original design operating point uh, for this installation. So it's operating at 1,000 gallons per minute. And right here is 50 feet. Right there is 50 feet. Okay. And so the uh, pump curve looks correct. And if you'll notice, it says that, well, the pump curve is showing us, this red line here is the actual curve itself, is that the pump is, is running just under 15 horsepower. And I think we said the horsepower, well, I can go back here in a second. Let's do that. 14.96, I think. 14.74, uh, yeah. 14.74. So that checks out. So that's the uh, that's the manufacturer's data. So that's the next tip. You need to collect the manufacturer's data. Now, in since we're talking specifically about troubleshooting a pump, and in this particular installation, it's only uh, a few weeks old, so that was at the beginning of the installation. We actually got a call. I, I thought this was really cool. We got a call the other day from a customer that had a pump problem or a flow problem. We don't never know if it's the pump. Uh, or not. He said, we have a flow problem. And uh, I said, well, give me, uh, again, I went through the same process. First, I get the call. I've got a problem. What's the problem? I have a flow problem. Okay, so let me interview you over the phone. Let me get some general information. And uh, they said, well, and, and I don't remember the flows and the heads and stuff, but uh, we're, we're measuring the flow by using a pressure differential across the um, chiller barrel. And we're, we're also measuring the flow using a non-invasive uh, flow meter, ultrasonic flow meter strapped to the pipe. And the, the pressure drop uh, across the chiller barrel says we're getting more flow, but then the flow meter says we're getting less flow. And so uh, I said, well, that, that's weird, you know? So th then I chatted some more and I said, okay, send me uh, the, information, do you have any information on the pump in terms of the model and the size? He says, actually, he says, I can send you the pump curve. So he sends me the pump curve and I look at the model number and, and Mario, I spoke to Mario about this the other day. It was a model BB, that's a Baker Baker. And Mario says, I don't think we've made the, those Baker Baker pumps for over 30 years. So I, I, I called the customer back and I said, uh, I said, how old is this installation? And they said, it was well, it's 40 years old. And I said, well, that's the problem. It's 40 years old. It's not, it's, <laughs> I mean, everything is wrong, right? I mean, the, the pre, it was a condenser water pump and, uh, you know, the piping is suspect, the pressure drop across the tiller is suspect, the velocity that they use, uh, if they're measuring the velocity using an ultrasonic meter and they're not correcting for the corrosion of the piping. So, I mean, just about everything you can think of is, is wrong. So, Unless you go through and do a very, very detailed uh, analysis of every single component in the system, um, you don't really know what the problem is. But I can tell you one thing, absolutely. After 40 years, the system does not resemble what it did when it was first installed 40 years ago. Well, anyway, getting back to our troubleshooting issue, uh, in this particular case, it was a fairly new installation, so it was easy to get the manufacturer's data, obviously, with a manufacturer, and I was able to pull up the data quite easily. Okay, and I'll get back to this a little bit later. So what else do we need to know? Well, we'd like to get uh, uh, some more detailed information, so we use the Commercial Pump Troubleshooting Report. 
and Mario was kind enough to send a copy of this uh, to me earlier today. I know it's tiny and you can't see it too well on the screen, but I've blown up sections of this report, and I'm going to go over that in a second. Uh, and I believe, uh, Brett, is it available to uh, to download? It is. Uh, the, uh, from what I can tell, the handout's available. If uh... The handout's available. Okay, so let's go through this and just uh, show you what's on this report. So the very first thing that's on the report is uh, is contact information, which is very important because um, when you start getting into troubleshooting and you're going through uh, material that people have sent you, you need to know who to call, where to get some more answers for things. Sometimes you need to talk to the contractor. Sometimes you need to talk to the customer or the rep or whoever it might be. So the contact information is, is important. And then the, on the right-hand side of the sheet here, you'll see it has product information. And, and we need that so that we can make sure that we're looking at the right uh, data in terms of our records also. And then the motor information and all the data. I'm not going to read everything here verbatim. Um, it's just all the information that's on the motor that we want to collect that and consolidate that into one location. The system information, as much information as possible. And then the uh, last thing is the, if there are any specific issues and if there are any additional comments. In other words, do we have unusual vibration? Do we have any noise? Is it squealing? Is it vibrating? Does it look like it's going to come jumping off the base? That sort of thing. Um, we also want to, uh, if they have a balancing report, um, to provide that for us and pictures. And as I said earlier, which I'm going to repeat, you can never have enough photographs. And because everybody's got smartphones today, it's good to do a couple of quick videos. Um, so the more information you have, the, the better your troubleshooting process is going to be. All right. Here's where I emphasize photographs. You can never have enough photographs. Uh, I, I can't tell you how many times I've looked at, uh, I've init got the initial call, we've got a flow problem, and then they send the photographs. I might, uh, you know, if I'm lucky and things are going well, may maybe I'll get 20 or 30 photographs. And sometimes we get real lucky and the photograph actually tells us what the problem is. Um, so yeah, photographs are extremely valuable. Videos, that's another uh, thing that's uh, important. Um, again, with, with smartphones today, it's easy to get uh, a video, especially if someone says, uh, oh, the pump is making a squealing sound uh, uh, or it's vibrating or something like that. If you can take a video of the pump, uh, it doesn't have to be two hours long. It, it only needs to be like 30 seconds or so and give us a rough idea of what's going on. So for the troubleshooting of the pump that that I was doing on this particular project, they sent me the photographs, and, uh, and, and we're going to get into that in a minute. They also sent me a video, by the way. Okay. So here's the... Uh, uh, here's the information that they ultimately came back with. Uh, the design was 1,000 GPM at 50 feet of head. And here's where I start analyzing the data. And so I'm just repeating these uh, slides for you to take a look at. Um, that's the same data I showed you before. But they were reporting that they were getting the same pressure differential of 50 feet but it was only pumping 500 gallons per minute. So I said, well, how could you get 50 feet at 500 gallons per minute? So I plotted, uh, using exactly the same pump curve, I plotted a different system curve, and I said, okay, if I was getting 500 gallons per minute, I should be 60 feet, but they told me they were only measuring 50 feet. I said, well, that doesn't make any sense. So let's go back, and now that I've analyzed the data a little bit, let's go back and look at some more information. So I asked them uh, to tell me about the suction pressure, and they said the suction pressure gauge was measuring uh, zero pounds per square inch or zero feet. And the discharge gauge was reading 50 feet. And so that was the pressure differential. But when I looked at the suction gauge in the photograph, I it occurred to me that the needle was pinned at zero. 
So I said, could you take a short video of the uh, suction gauge? And they did, and they only took, it only needed to run for, I said, I only need like 10, 15 seconds. Um, so they sent me the video and then I called them back. I said, look, when a, when a pump is running near or close to zero, the, the gauge, the actual needle on the gauge should be fluctuating a little bit, but since it's pinned, I'm wondering if it actually has uh, lower pressure than zero pounds. And they said, well, how can we figure that out? And I said, well, the, the simplest thing to do is to put in a compound gauge. So they got themselves a compound gauge, and here's a picture of a compound gauge. The compound gauge measures, this is really cool, it measures, uh, let me just go over here. Yep, here's my pen. On the positive side, the black letters are measuring pounds per square inch, that's PSI over here, when it's positive above zero. But when it's negative below zero, it's measuring in inches of mercury. That's what INHG stands for. And then the inside is in uh, metric in this particular compound gauge. But we're interested in what is the actual measurement. Now, if you'll notice, there's no pin here. In the previous gauge, let me go back here. Uh, in the previous gauge, there's an actual pin. So if this uh, pressure, if the suction pressure was actually lower than zero, it would not register that because it's held in place by the pin. So I had a hunch. I had a hunch that the actual pressure was below zero, was actually negative. So they got themselves a calibrated um, compound gauge. Let me see if I can erase my thing here. Yep. They got a uh, compound gauge and they installed that on the suction side of the pump. And when they did that, lo and behold, the pressure on the suction side of the pump was around uh, minus 10 inches of mercury, which is about five feet, roughly five feet. Uh, actually, it was measuring a little bit lower than that now that I think. Um, so it turned out that the pressure on the suction side was lower than was anticipated. So I said, well, that's weird. Why would the pressure on the suction side? So then I started asking some more questions. I said, okay, then let's go back here for a moment. And you told me that the uh, elevation change between between the water level inside the cooling tower and the center line of the pipe for the at the center line of the pump was four feet. This distance from here to here was four feet. So the next question I asked, and it turned out, I said, can you shut the entire system off on the condenser water side? And it turned out that they were very early in the commissioning process and they did not have to have the chiller running. So I got lucky. So when they shut it off, and here's where <clears throat> here's where the fun starts. And I'm going to ask the audience uh, to type in what they think the answer is. I had them shut everything off, and when they shut everything off, what do you think I got for pressure on the suction side of the pump, and what do you think I got for pressure on the discharge side of the pump? Anybody want to type that in and let me know, or what their best guess is from everything that we've got so far? Some Brad, people are saying chances? four feet. A lot of people are saying four feet. Yes. Two Absolutely. PSIG, four feet, 1.75 PSI. Correct. That's absolutely correct. Because if there's no flow, then the only reason that we have pressure on the suction side of the pump in an open system is a function of the elevation of the fluid from the water level in the cooling tower to the suction side of the pump. So this gauge right here. Um, is reading four feet. And the reason the discharge gauge is reading four feet is because the pump is not running and the suction gauge and the discharge gauge happen to be at the same elevation. And that one was also reading four feet. So that told me that the gauges were correct. And since I had a compound gauge, then when I started the pump up, then the pressure drop from the uh, inlet of the cooling tower has to be a function of the uh, flowing fluid. So I said, okay, um, now do one more thing again for me. Start the pump up 
and tell me what the pressure is again. And it turned out the pressure on the suction side of the pump was minus 10 feet. Look at that, Brett. Not bad, not bad. And the pressure on the discharge side of the pump was 50 feet. Now I'm gonna, I know it's late, and I know everyone's tired, but what is the pressure differential across the pump? Anybody want to unmute themselves or type it in or? A lot of 60s going in. Yes. So now we have an accurate flow reading here of 500 gallons per minute, 500 gallons per minute, and 60 feet of pressure differential. And since the suction side of the pump, when it was running, instead of being four feet, it's now 10 minus 10 feet. So then I went back and I said, okay, well, let me take a look at my uh, pump curve at 500 gallons per minute GPM. That's over here. GPM. Yeah. That's okay. It's that's legible. Not the best yeah, that's not the best GPM in the world. Okay, so I'm going to erase this and then go back to my uh, data. Oh, let me go back to that other pump curve. There it is. So I'm actually flowing 500 gallons per minute at uh, 60 feet. So there's 60 feet right there. And that's that red dot. That's exactly the same uh, pump configuration, the same diameter impeller, same speed. Um, so this represents the actual field conditions that we were measuring. So now the problem is, what is causing that pressure drop? Well, let's go back to the diagram one more time. And we said that the pressure on the suction side of the pump was minus 10 feet, and the discharge was 60 feet. So that means that if the pressure on the suction side of, of the pump was minus 10 feet, what was the actual pressure drop between the connection of the cooling tower and the suction side of the pump? Does anybody want to uh, uh, do that one for me? Nobody wants to uh I'm seeing some 14 feet coming in. Correct. You're absolutely right. Yay. So people are paying attention. That's a great thing, Brett. I got, yeah, there, there's a lot of, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of um, statements going on. Not many questions, but a lot of statements going on. That's for sure. 14 feet. What could possibly be causing this straight run of pipe? Remember, we said that the inlet size of this pump, I believe, let me just go, it was five. In, um, six no, to five. Six, six to five. Six inch. Okay, so with a six inch uh, pipe, all of this pipe was six inches here, what is the velocity and the suction side of this pump? Well, if it's running at 500 gallons per minute, let me do a quick look up here. If anybody can look this up while I'm checking it myself. So if I had a six inch section of pipe and I'm running at 500 gallons per minute, then Someone I, just typed in 5.55. I don't know if that's some. Um... Yeah, that's the velocity. Well, when I design a condenser water system, I like to be uh, less than eight feet per second. I prefer to be less than six feet per second. And this one's only 5.55 feet per second. And the pressure drop is only 2.36 feet per 100 feet of pipe. And I know for a fact, uh, they told me earlier that the suction, the length of pipe and the suction side was only 10 feet, so the pressure drop should be negligible. So anybody want to take a guess as to what I did next? Some people are saying strainers, closed valves, you're looking for blockage, basin strainer clog, suction diffuser clog, you know, a lot of statements here. Suction line size. Yeah, but how can I figure out uh, what's going on Remember, I'm troubleshooting, and yeah, intuitively, I'm, I'm looking for something, but there's nothing on the piping between the cooling tower and the section side of the pump. And I said, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. So 
I've already collected some of the material I need. I have it on my computer in the files. Does anybody know what I'm sort of hinting at here? What is it that I need to look at that they already sent me that will help me understand what's going on? Anybody want to take a guess? Photos, people are saying yes. photos. Yes, absolutely. Remember we said you can't have enough photographs? That's a, a major, major piece of information. So I get the photographs and I look through them carefully and lo and behold, there are two devices, two bulges in the piping system, but they're covered with insulation and I don't know what they are. So I call back and I said, look, I'm looking at the photographs. I can see two bulges right here. And uh, what are they? And the answer was, one is an isolation valve and the other one's a basket strainer. Ah, I oh said, boy. What size pipe are we talking about? Does anybody remember what size pipe? On the suction side of the pump? Wasn't it six inch? Six inch, uh, Doug. Six said. inch. Not real. So, what type of isolation valve is most commonly used on a uh, piping system uh, that's six inches in diameter? Butterfly, people are talking about. And typically, what kind of pressure drop would you expect to see above, across a butterfly valve that's 100% open? It's not zero. It doesn't well, have to be not. zero, but it's negligible. Right. Pretty close Pretty well. to zero. So what does that tell us? That tells us that the, the culprit is probably the basket strainer. Okay. So now that I've looked at the photographs, I make another phone call. I call up the the customer and I said, do me a favor. I said, uh, well, before you do me a favor, did you clean the strainer? Oh yeah, we took it out, we we pressure washed it, got it nice and clean, we put it, put it back in, it didn't make any difference. I said, do me a favor, take the strainer out of the basket strainer, button everything up and then turn the system on again. And lo and behold, when they did that, the suction pressure went from minus 10 to plus plus four. And when it did that, actually it went from minus 10 to plus 10, sorry. And when it did that, my pressure differential across the pump uh, went to uh, uh, 50 feet. I'm sorry, I did that backwards, I apologize. My suction pressure was uh, uh, just above four feet and my discharge pressure was just above 54 feet, so my pressure differential was 50 feet. I said, okay, now measure the flow, and when they measured the flow, they got the uh, 1,000 gallons per minute. So the problem was the basket strainer, there was something going on with the basket strainer. At this point, we're done. We can't tell you what's going on with the basket strainer. All we know is that when you take the strainer completely out of the basket, the pressure drop goes from roughly minus 14 feet to uh, what was essentially negligible. And the pressure across the pump uh, went to 50 feet and the flow went to 1,000 gallons per minute. So that was the process that we went through and the answer was to replace the basket strainer. Now, our job is not to figure out what the new basket strainer is. Our job is to help them identify what the flow problem is. And the flow problem, they realized, was related to the basket strainer. They couldn't account for why the pressure drop was so great across the basket strainer. Maybe there was a problem with manufacturing. Maybe there was something unusual going on. Maybe it was the wrong size. Doesn't matter. We've proven that it was the basket strainer. The pump runs fine. The pressure drop across the basket strainer should never be as high as what was actually measured. And so that was the uh, uh, solution to the problem, replace the basket strainer. Problem solved. Hey, Rich, the, um, great statement right here that said, um, uh, he, the gentleman typed in, one time he was involved with a project and there was a light over the tower, right? And at night, this light was on and it attracted all kinds of bugs. And that strainer would fill up with bugs almost nightly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've seen some pretty weird yeah, things I mean, out you, there. you can't make this stuff up. You know, yeah. poor Mario gets questions on stuff like this on a daily basis. <laughs> so, uh, so let's go back just uh, quickly to the original list. The 
original list of things that we talked about. And here's what we said. So, um, and I'm just going to run through them quickly again. So you can see how important it is to go through each one of these tips because uh, ultimately the process that you go through is going to help you figure out what ultimately the problem is with the system. And again, in this particular instance, it was a, a system problem and not a pump problem. Now it turns out that when we do troubleshooting, uh, especially if it's a flow problem and there's a pump involved, the overwhelming majority of times it's not the pump. The pumps are very simple, they're very predictable, um, so very rarely is it the pump. So that's why we go through this particular process and we take each step, one, each item one step at a time to uh, come up with a recommended solution. So any questions about all the wonderful stuff that we covered so uh, somebody uh, also typed in a, a, a tree lit nearby leaves it was causing issues. Can you go back to your diagram? Someone's questioning something about your diagram. I just want to make sure we address this. Um, just zoom in. Okay. Uh, how come the water flow at the cooling tower? And I think you're just—I'll let you answer this. Is is around uh, 1,005 GPM, and the flow at the pump is 1,500 GPM. Oh, that's a good, wow, that's that's a very good observation. Uh, the software did that to me and I didn't even pick it up. I was trying to generate a very simple diagram for this presentation. You have and, two different uh, delta T's, that's why. You, you have a delta T, yeah, magic, Gordon says. You have a delta T at the chiller and a delta T at the um, tower that I think if they match, then they would match. So yeah. the software's fighting each other. Anyways. It's, yeah, well, that's a good catch. Thank you so much for that, because when I do this presentation again, I'll fix that diagram. So that's a yep. great observation. You know, most of the time when we do these presentations, the, the people listening are no more than us. So, so, so Mario typed in, what do you say when they ask for recommendations to fix the flow problem? I'm not sure how general that can be, Mario, to be specific, a little more specific. You know what I mean, Rich? That's what he typed in. Um, I'm, I'm only guessing. Uh, Mario, yeah. do you want to unmute yourself and and? Uh, I don't think he can unless he can type it in though. Well, either way, yeah. Yeah. Help us understand what it is that he's trying to tell us. Anyways, so really, Rich, I, I mean, it be, it becomes a, a, I won't say it's a guessing game, but it's a process of elimination as you go through things, right? I mean. <laughs> Well, I guess the, what the point I wanted to make for this uh, discussion was that it's the process that uh, reveals ultimately the problem and, and points to a solution. And, and you have to have, uh, you have to sort of take these 10 steps in order in order to uh, develop, uh, you know, a, a good understanding of what's going on. And you can, most of the time you can solve the problem uh, by uh, adhering to those sort of 10 basic steps. And and I I would assume most of the time I know I know from experience um, you're going to be using um, the um, the pump curves and as much data as you can get and the pump curves have a lot of information on them that you can weed through as you go through them right I, I mean yes obviously so. Uh... Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, that's where we sort of come to the point where we're going to talk about the bonus material. But let's answer any last minute questions before we go through the bonus material. Any other questions out there on what we presented so far? Needed to get more info on strainer to make recommended designer may not have included strainer and pressure drop calc should have used HSS. <laughs> that's true, Jim, <laughs> should have used HSS. So, so should true. have used the HSS software, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and this was a real problem, by the way. This is not a made-up uh, problem. I did change the numbers slightly to make it a little easier to see the numbers in a presentation format. And when I was talking to the uh, uh, the customer on the phone, uh, they said, well, what do you think would have caused the pressure drop? What do you think is causing the pressure drop in the strainer? And I tell you, I, honestly, I, I have no idea. Unless I took the strainer back to, uh, you know, our test lab and ran through a series of tests and, but of course, we don't manufacture basket strainers, so it's not really something that we should get involved with. I said, I, I would go back to the mass, uh, basket strainer 
uh, manufacturer and, and uh, see if they can come up with an answer. I mean, the the, the data was was uh, you know there was no debate about the data. Mm. We took the uh, the published pressure drop. I think uh, that they told me at the time was something like one or two feet with the strain of clean. But for some unknown reason, it had this uh, unpredictable pressure drop, and uh, I, you know, at that point, we don't manufacture strainers. We're not experts in strainers. All we did is identify the problem. They were grateful that we helped them identify the problem, and, and it was up to them to figure out how they could solve it. Yeah, yeah so I mean, some people are saying the different manufacturer with a lower pressure drop or better flow coefficients, you know, uh, maybe the size of the mesh could be the issue. Uh, the size of the strainer itself, uh, fine mesh versus open basket that will only remove pea gravel size material. There's all yeah. different, as you said, there's so many uh, issues uh, related to a strainer. It's it's uh, it's pretty amazing, you know. Yeah, so the, the moral of the story here is that it's the process that winds up being the, the best uh, tool that you can use. And if you go through those 10 uh, uh, tips that we gave you for the process, uh, Chances are you're going to have a very good idea of, of what's going on, and then and then if you develop a hypothesis or if you develop a, a, a potential uh, you know solution, and, and you want to test it again, the the value of having all those photographs. If I didn't have all those photographs, I I would be lost. But I, I plowed through the photographs, and that's when I realized his original sketch that he gave me wasn't complete. There was missing information. Now, I had a pretty good idea that there would be an isolation valve uh, on the suction side of the pump, so I wasn't surprised uh, that, that he did left that off his sketch. But um, I was very surprised that he left off the basket strainer, and it wasn't until I went through the photographs that I realized there was something else there, and that's when we solved the problem. Now, you, you made a statement, and I'm going to reiterate it. <laughs> and please, audience, don't take this the wrong way. But when there's a pump issue on a project, most of the time, 80 to 90 percent of the time, it's a system issue. Wouldn't you agree with that, Rich? Mario, yeah, wouldn't you agree? I don't, I don't call them uh, pump uh, problems anymore. <laughs> I call them flow problems. And you're yeah. absolutely correct. The overwhelming majority of flow problems are uh, system related. And when we go into some of this bonus material, we'll talk a little bit about uh, what we mean by system related. Uh, issues. And Elizabeth says, Elizabeth typed in, especially if it's a takeo pump. <laughs> so true. <laughs> Good point, Elizabeth. Thank you. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you said that uh, because the, the reality <laughs> is that, uh, you know, the, the folks that are in the factory, they have uh, very high standards for quality control. I mean, we're an ISO we're an ISO facility. I don't know, we're proud of that. Uh, you know, we yeah, don't advertise it as much as we should, but very, know. very rarely do we have uh, a pump problem. We we actually had uh, this one came up actually. I think it's been about two months, maybe three months ago now, and uh, it was a flow issue, and we actually uh, built the identical pump that was out in the field and ran the, a series of tests in our test lab and the data that we had in the test lab matched the published data, data perfectly and so we were able to prove to the customer without even taking the pump out of the system because we built an identical pump with the identical impeller um, that it was not a, a pump issue it has to be a system issue and so that gave them confidence to start looking for more problems on the system side jim just so, typed in yeah. last Jim just typed in. Last flow issue I had was was the pump was running backwards. Replacement wired wrong. I, I mean, it happens. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. First thing to check is the rotation. Absolutely correct. I'm glad they brought that up. Yep. And I and I would like to. I would also like to add um, my uh, a, a statement. Uh, our Takeo actually has someone during working hours that answers the phone and transfers you to us uh, uh, an expert like mario or rich or myself or others um, uh, but i will also say this uh, that our rep force our rep network and hopefully most of you if not all of you know who your reps are uh, and i know all, all fats on the on here and she's she's as smart as uh, as there is uh, up in the, the canada anyway she's one of our reps um, they can answer a lot of the questions rich just some of them are so senior 
uh, laden people that they they know the answers as well. Wouldn't you agree with that, Rich? Yeah, that's. Uh, I always tell folks that is is that uh, the first line of defense is to go back to the rep, and they have extensive experience, um, and and usually they can solve, and they actually they do on a daily basis. They they are the first line of defense, and they, and they solve the overwhelming majority of issues that come up. And then uh, what I always say is that uh, that uh, then then sometimes the you know the problem is then translated and trans transferred over to tech services and and folks like Mario get involved and actually the only time I get involved uh, that Brett and I actually get involved is if uh, if Mario says you know what I think I know what the answer is I'd like to bounce it off of you guys but nine you know 99.9% .9 of the time somebody said that once let me just uh, it's kind of a joke they said well um, what is it? 95% of the time, people make up the percentages on the spot. So I'm making up the percentage, but it's true. <laughs> the overwhelming majority of the time, uh, our tech services group knows exactly what the answer is. Once they collect the data, you know, you have to still go through the process. There's no way getting around it because if you don't, you miss something major, and then uh, you're just chasing your tail. But uh, yeah, they uh, and, and uh, uh, Gordon typed in. You know, running backwards happens, uh, but um, every once in a while, um, uh, and, and Takeo has had this issue as well, um, it can be an incorrect impeller size, and I think Rich is going to talk about some of that uh, shortly. Anyways, uh, back to you, my friend. <laughs> yeah, do we have any other uh, questions before we go on to the bonus material? No, so someone just said 85% just... of statistics are made up on the on spot. On the spot, that's, that's correct. Yeah. Just typed in. <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> and then if if uh, if if you ever do call Takeo, this is what you might hear. Thank you for calling Takeo. Carla speaking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's 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 true. I was uh, I you know what was the, what's the old joke? Uh, yeah, no, no, you're right. You call Takeo and you get a live person, and very rarely uh, do you not get a live person. So we're very proud of that. And there's the old joke. Suicide hotline, please hold. Your call is important to us. Anyway. True. Okay. Nope, you're in good shape. Pumps All do right, what so, they, they're designed to do. That's what someone said. <laughs> so now we're going to go on to uh, some of this bonus material. And the good thing about the bonus material is that it's uh, it's almost 8 o'clock. Um, and so the bonus material goes from now until midnight, East Coast time. Oh, boy. So, <laughs> You might be on your own. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go through some of that bonus material. Let's see what it says here. Okay, so we call I call this the uh, uh, Takeo After Dark bonus material. Look at that. And like as Brett, go ahead, Brett. I said I like it. I like it. And as Brett said a minute ago, let's talk a little bit about what the pump curve is telling us. And now this is again the pump curve for the specific problem that we were having. And uh, there, was a, there was a lot of information here that is of value. So one of the things that uh, they ultimately uh, provided to me was the amount of power that the electric motor was, uh, uh, was being used. So let me rephrase that. The amount of power that the pump was consuming from the electric motor and the power that the pump was consuming, let me go back here for a moment, because they actually provided this data for me. And if we go back to the alternate operating point, you can see right here that the when it was pumping 500 gallons per minute with a 60 feet of head, that was this curve over here. And I'll get back to that in a second. Look at the power consumption. It's uh, predicted to be around 11 horsepower. And it turned out the data that they sent me originally, well, actually, they sent me the data sort of after I, I figured it out on the phone. Uh, the data that they collected, it showed that they were actually uh, consuming 11 horsepower in, in around that order of magnitude. And so that was the other big hint that there was a, uh, an obstruction on the suction side of the pump. The other issue was that, look at the net positive suction head. Well, if the pump was running at minus, uh, roughly minus 10 feet, 
it turns out that uh, the net positive suction head required by the pump was only eight feet, and the available pressure, I think, turns out if you do the calculation, turns out to be about 15 feet. So there was plenty of pressure available, so cavitation was not an issue. And the other part of the troubleshooting is, you remember I asked for the short video. When they took the video, there was nothing unusual about the noise that the pump was generating. It was just generating the normal noise that pump-motor combination generates. So that was another sort of hint as to what was going on. Uh, so it was not a cavitating issue, and that we were able to also eliminate. Okay. So um, when we get back here to the pump curve, so the non-overloading horsepower, let me zip over here. Yeah, the non-overloading horsepower in this case was around 15, just over 15 horsepower. So uh, I confirmed that the electric motor was actually a 20 horsepower motor. So it was not a problem with consuming too much power from the motor. Now the design operating point was 14.74 at the design operating point. And like I said, at around 500 gallons per minute, you can see over here that it was a little bit over 10 horsepower. Uh, so it turned out that this, the uh, curve was telling me that it was around 11 horsepower, which was what they were measuring out there. So that was another piece of information. Um, the other piece of information is the shutoff head. Now, in this particular case, we did not need to do a shutoff head test because the problem revealed itself before we got to asking for the shutoff head because the shutoff head when we measure the shutoff head that's when we measure the pressure differential across the pump at zero flow whenever i ask for someone to do a shutoff head test sometimes they refer to it as deadheading the pump i always tell them to only do it for a few seconds they say how could i do that the data for a few seconds well with a smartphone it's very simple and straightforward you have one person who's gonna close the discharge valve, only the discharge valve, never the suction valve, but the discharge valve. And then you can use your smartphone and you take a picture of the suction gauge, a picture of the discharge gauge, and then you open the valve. And that only takes about five seconds. And, and I, I prefer to have the pump shut off head test done in less than 10 seconds. And that way the pump doesn't overheat, the, the seal doesn't get uh, overheated and it doesn't uh, destroy itself. But in this particular troubleshooting problem, I did not need the shutoff head because I was able to figure out before we get to that point. So why do I need the shutoff head? It was to confirm the impeller diameter. And one thing that we have to be careful of is that the shutoff head can vary as much as uh, eight feet, plus or minus eight feet. So in other words, in this particular uh, pump curve, you can see the shutoff head is almost exactly 60 feet but the actual field data measurement could have been as much as 68 feet or as low as 52 feet. And that, that you do get a slight variation between uh, one pump and another, and that's within the allowance uh, by the Hydraulic Institute. So when we design and build our pumps, it generally never fluctuate as much as uh, eight feet, but occasionally we get a pump where the shutoff head could be slightly higher or lower. Uh, but that uh, gives us a rough indication that we have the right size impeller. So that Im important information can be gathered from the pump curve. More information. Let's keep going here. Any, and, any questions, Brett, as we go through this stuff? No, no. Oh, wait. One just came in here. Jay typed something in. Okay. Even though they didn't have a compound gauge on the suction, wouldn't reading zero indicate an issue? The inlet pressure should always be positive. No, the inlet pressure does not have to be positive. Um, it can be negative as long as the uh, net positive suction head available is greater than what's required by the pump. And occasionally we do get uh, condenser water systems with open cell cooling towers where the suction side of the pump is in fact negative, but the net positive suction head available is greater than what's required by the pump. So it's not an operating issue. It, it runs yeah. fine. Yeah, but what, what Jay was referring to, I believe, he said, even though they didn't have a compound gauge on the suction, wouldn't reading zero indicate an issue? You know what I no. mean? You said you said when you first seen that gauge, um, the old style gauge or the original gauge, it was reading zero. Um, he's implying shouldn't have that have been a positive number? No. 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 It doesn't have to be a positive number at all. Okay. I suspected that was a problem because I didn't see the gauge fluctuating. Because right. even you know in, in 
let's let's assume for a moment i know it wasn't the true in this case let's assume that the pressure on the suction side of the pump was 10 feet positive well it, I, I don't care whose pump it is but the pump operates and there's always a tiny fluctuation as the pump is running uh with the needle valve and when it was pegged and that told me that the pressure was probably less than zero and that and that way that's why the the uh, needle wasn't moving at all. That was, and that, the only way I knew that was by looking at carefully looking at the video. Any other yep. question? Uh, no. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the process that we have to go through for measuring flow and head. So um, when we take measurements in the field, these are the measurements that we generally ask for, and that's on that uh, that uh, data sheet that we that's part of the handout. So we obviously want uh, the flow in gallons per minute. We want the suction pressure, the discharge pressure. We want the power. Now, so how do you measure power in the field? Well, in this particular case, by the way, that I was doing the troubleshooting, it actually was easier to measure the power because there was no variable frequency drive. And when there's no variable frequency drive, then we can measure the amperage at the motor. Now, I don't physically uh, measure the electrical data. I always ask for a licensed electrician to measure the data for us uh, because they typically use a clamp-on amp probe uh, over the wires that lead to the motor, and you're going to have exposed wires. You have to know what you're doing, so you need to be a licensed electrician in order to take that data. So if you have the motor data, which again, that comes to the manufacturer's information, if you have the motor data and you're measuring the voltage and the amperage at the motor, and if you'll notice on our uh, spread, not our spread, yes, our data sheet, we ask for the uh, amperage for each of the three legs if it's a three-phase motor. That's important uh, because if you have one of the uh, phases that's reading a higher amperage than one of the others, that could indicate that there's a problem with the electric motor. But anyway, you measure the voltage and the amperage for each of the three legs, and then you can, from that, you can calculate the horsepower. Does anybody need to know how to calculate the horsepower by taking the motor uh, amperage and voltage readings? Anybody? We got a, a yes. We got a yes. Oh, what was the yes for, Brett? Um, the horsepower from voltage readings. Yes. So when you get the motor data, um, let's see if I can do this without screwing this up. So the, the horsepower that the motor is putting out, you ready? The horsepower is equal to, if it's a three-phase motor, it's equal to the measured voltage, V for voltage, times the measured amperage. I'm just going to put the letter A here. I don't think they use the letter A when it comes to electrical stuff, but I'm going to use it tonight. Voltage times the amperage times the square root of three times the motor efficiency, and that's expressed in a decimal. So in other words, if the motor was 94%, you would use the, I'm gonna put the, yeah, motor efficiency. I'll put an M up here just so we don't lose track of it. Motor efficiency times the power factor. And that, in many of, uh, especially the Baldor motors, the uh, power factor and the efficiency is right on the nameplate. So you measure the voltage, uh, you multiply the volts times the amps times the square root of three times the efficiency times the power factor, that will give you um, watts. And now you have to convert watts into kW, so you divide by 1,000 uh, 1, watts per kW watts per kW, and you divide by 0.746, you put that under here, multiply that, and you divide that by 0.746 because it's 0.746 uh, kW. Look at that. Oh, God, this is painful, Brett, per <laughs> horsepower. Looks it. 
Now, so and so that's the formula for taking the field voltage, the field amperage, and taking right off the nameplate the motor efficiency and the power factor, plugging it into this equation, and you will get the horsepower that the motor is generating for power. And that is the power input to the pump. So in our case, the pump should have been consuming 14, I think it was 14.74 horsepower. But the measured data indicated that it was consuming around 11 horsepower, approximately 11 horsepower. And so that's why we knew that it was, that was one of the hints, if you will, that the, uh, uh, there was a problem with the system. And by the way, we say, we use this phrase all the time, we say that power never lies. Well, it, it never lies as long as you're taking accurate uh, voltage, amperage readings, and you have the proper efficiency and the power factor. Those values vary slightly depending on the load of the motor. And so it's best to not only, uh, it's best to use the uh, motor, the published motor curves, as opposed to just the, uh, uh, published data on the motor tag uh, for efficiency and power factor because the efficiency and power factors add a, a fully loaded motor. But it gives you a pretty close estimate as to how much power the motor is producing or another way of saying it is how much power the pump is consuming. Does uh, anybody have any questions about that little equation? Someone typed in, Frank typed in, is that averaged over three phases? Well, that's why it's important to take the uh, amperage reading for each phase because the amperage reading for each phase should be, for all practical purposes, within less than 1% variation from each other. If you have a substantial variation in uh, amperage on each phase, you probably have a problem with the electric motor itself. The wind There's something wrong with the windings. Um, so... Can you average them? Yes, as long as they're within 1% of each other, I don't have a problem averaging them. The other thing is that when you're taking amperage reading, especially if you're using an amprobe, uh, the clamp-on type, uh, from when you change the clamp from one lead to the other, it, sometimes you get a slight variation, and you don't realize it, that uh, it's, it's fluctuating a little bit. So, yeah. Um, you can average it as long as it's within one or two percent of each other. And if it's greater than that, if the amperage winds up being five percent or greater, you should start looking at a problem with the electric motor. Any other questions? Nope. This is exciting stuff tonight, Brett. I know. I like it. Okay. So that's what I mean by measuring uh, the power, uh, either in horsepower or kW, and that's how you actually measure the power. Um, it's important to confirm the fluid type. We've had this problem in the past where, uh, now for tonight's discussion, this was all about condenser water, but if it was chilled water or hot water, um, we have gone down sort of this issue of uh, saying, well, you know, we, we took the measurements and the, you know, we looked at the pump curve and all this other stuff. And I said, what fluid are you using? And I said, well, we're using 30% uh, uh, propylene glycol, of course. I said, well, that's not what the selection was based on. The selection was based on water. So it's important to, to find out what the actual fluid is being used in the system because sometimes people will make the mistake of uh, selecting and scheduling a pump for water and forgetting that they actually have uh, glycol in their system. So it's important to, to do that. And also it's important to measure the RPM. Our pumps are tested. Let me go back to the previous slide for a moment. Ah. Our pumps are tested at uh, 1760 RPM, 1760 right here. However, most premium efficiency motors spin at a higher speed. Most of them, the premium efficiency motors are spinning at somewhere between 1780 and 1790 RPM. So you have to correct the, the field data for the spin. So that means that once you get all of the recorded data, you have to correct for the change and get, well, let's just go to the, um, uh, let's see. Yeah, sorry about that. You, you have to correct for the actual RPM 
and you have to correct for the change in gauge height. So on a suction, uh, end suction pump, uh, the best place to take the reading is at the pump flange on the suction side and on the discharge side. And it's best to have the center line of the gauge at equal elevation. Um, and if you don't, if you have the suction gauge down here, let me just draw a line. If you have, if you're measuring the suction gauge over here and the discharge gauge over here, that elevation change from here to here has to be included in your pressure differential calculation. That height in feet. Now, uh, when it comes to pumps, it's generally not a major issue because the gauges are relatively at the same elevation. But we actually had this problem, um, about a, I think it was about a year ago. That there was a plate and frame heat exchanger. We'll make a little rectangle up here, plate and frame heat exchanger. And there was the four connections on the inlet and the outlet. So I'm just gonna arbitrarily make it. Say there's the inlet and the outlet. And they said that they were getting uh, a higher pressure drop than they originally anticipated. It was supposed to have like a three foot pressure drop. I'm just gonna kind of make up this first number here, but the second one is pretty accurate. It's supposed to have a, a three foot pressure drop, but they're actually getting uh, eight foot pressure drop, eight foot. And so we had to tell them, I said, well, did you measure the difference? Then they were measuring the pressure here and another gauge they were measuring up here. Well, the height of the plate and frame heat exchanger from gauge connection to gauge connection was 14 feet. Mm -hmm. It's a big 14, one. 14 feet. And uh, so I'm, I'm sorry, it was uh, it was in not feet, it was in pounds, PSI. So it was supposed to be uh, three PSI, and in fact, it was eight PSI, PSIG. I really screwed that one up, didn't I, Brett? Uh, it's getting late, Rich. It's getting late. It's getting late, yeah. So uh, if you convert 14 feet, you take 14. How do you do that? How do you do that? 14 <laughs> divided by 2.31 is approximately six uh, feet. And so that's what accounted for the, uh, the difference in the gauge heights. So you have to uh, account for that. Isn't that fun? Yep. Uh, okay, the other thing you have to account for is the change in velocity. Well, on a suction, uh, end suction pump, we said a minute ago, our pump had a six inch inlet and a five inch outlet. Uh, you, if you're measuring the pressure at the uh, flange of the pump, then you have to correct for the change in velocity. Uh, so that's an important piece. And you also have to uh, correct for motor efficiency and if there happens to be a variable frequency drive, you have to uh, correct for drive efficiency. And what do I mean by correcting for motor efficiency? I sort of hinted at it before. When the motor is fully loaded, 100% loaded, the name ta tag on the motor is accurate for motor efficiency. But if you change the um, amount of power that you're asking the motor to deliver, the efficiency will change slightly. So it's better to get the efficiency from the motor curve than it is from the nameplate based on how much the motor is loaded. Okay, any questions before I talk a little bit about uh, pressure gauges? Nope. So I put up here, just so people are aware, that uh, these are probably the three most common types of gauges. Um, conventional gauge, again, typically has a pin and I'll point to the pin right there, it typically has a pin and uh, it's calibrated so it just, it, just, it just fits on the pin at zero pounds per square inch. The second type of gauge is a compound gauge and on, uh, I recommend that for every pump, especially in an open cell cooling tower, let me rephrase that. If, it's, if the pump is connected to an open cell cooling tower, I would absolutely recommend a compound gauge. Uh, because especially if the elevation of the cooling tower is not that great relative to the center line of the pump, you want to have a compound gauge just in case it's running negative. It doesn't mean it, it won't run properly, but you need to know what the actual pressure differential is. And you put it in your spec. Put it, put it right in your spec tonight. 
put it in your spec. <laughs> I like that. So here's the other thing that uh, I always tell people about. This outer scale here is in pounds per square inch. The same thing over here, this outer scale, the black numbers are pounds per square inch. So here's a, here's a trivia, not a trivia question, but here's a question for the audience. If I have a, um, let's say I had, uh, I'm using this gauge on the left here, conventional gauge. Um, if I had a, a, an operating pressure on the suction side of the pump that was uh, 30 PSI, um, is a quick question, should I use this gauge that I'm showing you right now or should I use a different uh, gauge? And I know I'm being a little bit uh, sneaky about my question here, um, but maybe someone will pick up on that. But we'll give you, in a minute, we'll give you the answer. Anybody uh, typed in anything yet, Brett? Different. Jim says different. Use zero to 100, Mario said. You use a gauge where the, the mid reading, this is the mid reading roughly here, is roughly equal to your operating pressure. So in other words, if this gauge, uh, if our operating pressure was 30 pounds, we'd wanna select a gauge where the mid reading here would be roughly 30 pounds, and the full reading might be in, in the order of magnitude of around 60 pounds back here. Because you, to get an accurate reading from a pressure gauge, you want it to be reading roughly in the center of the gauge. So you don't want you don't want that to, to, to be up to 500, then, huh? <laughs> little yeah. little smaller, little small. You don't want to go bigger. You want to go smaller sometimes. Yeah, I, I mean, if this was on a suction side of the pump and the actual pressure on the suction side of the pump was say five psi, I wouldn't want to use this gauge. It's not that accurate. It's much more accurate if it's in the mid range of the gauge. <clears throat> the second one we talked about already is compound gauge, and some uh, systems are now using digital gauges. These are kind of cool. Um, we don't see that many, to be honest with you, but in some applications, people are specifying digital gauges. Some more tips and things. So, how do you? Oh, that's the other thing. So, um, whenever I Whenever I do a gauge, I always ask for the gauge to be calibrated. And so th the question came up a few weeks ago. Well, so, well, when you ask for a gauge to be calibrated, you know, how do, how do we get the gauge to be calibrated? Most suppliers today that are supplying multi, uh, the large numbers of gauges usually have the ability in their shop to calibrate a gauge. And it's it's a very simple device like this. You can see that there is a reference gauge. I mean, ah, grab a pen here. There is a reference gauge right here. That's what this guy is. That's a reference gauge. And then you connect your gauge, the one that you want to test, to this port here. And then there is a hydraulic uh, piston inside of here. By turning this crank, let's say you turn it this way, it creates a force against the fluid that's uh, inside the piston. And it, these two gauges should read the same exact value. And, and if it doesn't, they can uh, adjust the gauge. Usually they pull the pin off, uh, the, not the pin, they, they pull the needle off and they can uh, change the position and that's how they calibrate. But this device right here uh, is used for calibrating gauges. It's very simple, it's very straightforward, it's easy to use. This pump on the right here is for pumping up uh, to get close to the reading and then you crank the crank here to fine tune the pressure. So if you want, uh, if you want to make sure your mid pressure in your system is 150 PSI, your reference gauge is can measure 150 PSI, you would use the pump to maybe get to 120 PSI, and then you'd use the hand crank to, to fine tune it. And then when your reference gauge read 150, you should be reading 150 on your gauge right here. So that's how you calibrate the gauge. Easy enough to do. But you don't do it. The point is that it, the instrumentation is readily available. And so to request that you get a calibrated gauge, 
they usually they can do it. I can send it out to someone that has this instrumentation. It's very simple. I know how to check a gauge if it's broken. If you have two gauges, flip them. Yes. <laughs> the old yes. flip gauge. The old yeah. flip yeah. gauge trick. <laughs> Good point, Brett. Yeah. So if you have a suction gauge, uh, like here on the suction side of the pump, and you know it should be reading around 10 feet, but it's reading something different than that. Uh, but you want to get the pressure differential so you can take your reading on the suction side here and then move the gauge from the suction side to the discharge. And generally speaking, if a gauge is out of calibration, you might not get its absolute reading. I shouldn't use the word absolute when it comes to gauges. Yeah. Um, but you may not get its accurate reading, but the differential is usually pretty accurate unless the gauge is completely busted. So, yeah, move the gauge. It's, it's like what you said last week or a couple of weeks. I think it was last week. Can't have enough valves, but you can't have enough gauges either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how do you measure flow? Well, there are two, two basic methods. The one that's the most popular is some type of insertion flow meter. This particular one happens to be a photograph of an Onicon meter. It's a magnetic meter. And uh, we actually have several of these installed in the piping system back at the factory, and so we can get very accurate flow readings. Um, another one that's used for troubleshooting, which we also have, uh, if they have it in tech services. I think Ben Needham is the uh, protector of our ultrasonic flow meter. This is a meter that you can strap on to a piece of pipe and uh, it'll give you a relatively accurate flow meter. So you can use, um, the one on the left is called an invasive meter because it has to go within the water stream. So let me just draw the pipes so you don't get confused here. So this actually fits inside the pipe. There's the pipe right there, Let's say from here to here. There's our pipe. I kind of put a little pipe thing here. Look at that, it almost looks like I know what I'm doing here. And yeah, a little bit like that. So there's the pipe, and maybe the flow is in this direction. Uh, so because it, it's inside the uh, material that's flowing, that's called an invasive meter. And this one is a strap-on. Nothing is inside the pipe, and so this is a non-invasive. So we use ultrasonic flow meters for uh, checking the flow. Um, but it, what we like to do is we like to get folks to think in terms of specifying a much more accurate meter. Now, generally speaking, these guys need 15 pipe diameters on the suction, on the, on the inlet side, rather. 15 uh, pipe diameters. So how do you make, put that? Put a, like a circle. And then on the down, downstream side, they want 10 pipe diameters. And with a straight pipe, straight pipe. Uh, 15 on the suction. So if the pipe is, uh, say, 4 inch diameter, just kind of make up a number here. 15 times 4 is 60 inches. So you'd need 60 inches on the inlet side, 5 feet, and then 40 inches, which is 3.5 feet. Is that 3.5? Is that just under 3.5. It would be 42 inches if it was 3.5. Um, that'd be uh, uh, rough, roughly 4 feet. That'd be 40 inches. Uh, roughly three and a half, rather. Sorry. Okay. That's some other stuff to think about. Now, here's Someone the other had, thing. Now that you're talking about gauges, and uh, I've seen this done before, and I think it's in actually some of our instruction uh, booklets, um, what about using one gauge with valves to isol isolate the opposing pressures? I'm not sure I understand what... Uh, what are they what are they referring to? Well, sometimes they, um, people have used one gauge and they put valves. Uh, well, you, you'd have to look at it. Oh, Anyways, oh, oh, yeah. You yeah, like, yeah. Uh, you, uh, yes, they use yes. A, there is a problem with that. I have a problem with that. Yeah. The, the problem that I have uh, with that is that, well, do I have a problem? Yes, I have a problem because sometimes uh, people will measure the pressure differential by opening the valves on both sides of the gauge. And what you, what you do then is you create a small amount of bypass around the pump. And that affects the pressure differential reading. So if you're going to use one gauge and use the little valve in the, the piping method, 
uh, when you take your reading, you should take one uh, reading at a time and not open both both right. sides. Yeah. Yeah. No, nope, that's a that's a good way of doing yep. it. Too. Okay. Uh, when we refer now, when in terms of installation, we we want to make sure that uh, when, when the system when the piping is installed, it's piped. We pipe away from the pump. Pipe away from the pump. What do we mean by that? We mean that the pump needs to be installed. If it's an end suction pump, uh, it needs to be leveled. The base needs to be leveled. It needs to be grouted. If the pump needs to be aligned. All of those things need to, to happen. And then you start piping from the uh, pump to the system. And then if the system pipe, and I'm going to exaggerate this for a moment. Um, if the system pipe is is off, let's say here's the system pipe here. So here's the discharge side of the pump. And let's say the system pipe is up here. So the center line of this pipe is obviously not in line with the center line of this pipe. Then you have to have some kind of corrective action, which means that you have to have some kind of device that makes up the difference in that offset. You can't just take this pipe and and, and we see this way too often. Actually, I'm going to exaggerate. Let's say this is a flange connection here, and then the pipe has a flange on it over here. And the, as you can see, the system pipe is offset. We, we've seen this, and it's not the right thing to do. They'll take a uh, put a strap around this pipe and a strap around this pipe, and they'll use a come along, and then they'll draw those two pipes together and bolt it up. But that puts too much stress on the pump. So we should always pipe away from the pump. The other thing is because if the pipe at the, let's say on the suction side here, let's say that the actual pipe just before we make the connection is offset, just like I showed that other one. And then again, they draw that down to the connection of the pipe. That puts stress on the pump and that can distort the pump, believe it or not, even though it's made out of steel, it'll distort it ever so slightly the pump can vibrate, you can have all kinds of problems, bearings wear out prematurely, all kinds of problems. So we always say you pipe away from the pump. That's another tip. We're almost yeah, done we with our tips here, Fred. Yeah, we didn't even get into all the vibration and alignment and all that. That's another whole course unto itself. Yeah, I just, to touched, do I just touched base on it here. Um, yeah. Our in installation manual says that the alignment, um, if you'll notice what we say here, we have a little, this is uh, copied right out of our installation manual. There's the correct alignment right there. This is wrong, this is wrong, and the alignment between the motor shaft and the pump shaft has to be within five thousandths of an inch. That's right here on our installation manual. So I won't go into the process of how you align it, but it's important that they are aligned if it's a, a base mounted pump. If it's a closed coupled pump, the motor shaft, the, the impeller is actually connected directly to the motor shaft. There was no alignment required. So it's only our base mounted pumps that require alignment. And the vertical inlines do not require alignment because they're machine fit. Good stuff. Yep. Got a couple more tips here. Grouting. So how do you grout? What do you use? Well, you use commercial grade, quick crete, fast set, non-shrink grout. There's a whole mouthful for you. Holy moly, 832 Holy moly. and you're throwing things like that at us. It's called Quickcrete 1583, that's the model. And people ask this all the time, well, what do you mean by grout? Well, it's it's actually manufactured by companies like Quickcrete. This happens to be the spec that uh, we recommend. It's uh, Quickcrete 15, model 1583. There is no stones in it. Basically, it's just uh, concrete, and you mix it with water in a nice little galvanized bucket, and you pour it. Once the pump is leveled and it's aligned and all that other stuff, actually, you have to redo the alignment after you pour them. But once it's leveled, you pour the grout in here, and when the grout fills all the voids, and that's the... Uh, and it's non-shrink, so that means that when it hardens, it doesn't pull away from the pump base. So that's how you grout a pump. It's very simple. We don't do it, obviously, but the mechanical contractor does it, and it's a very simple process. So if you if you see a pump that has not been grouted, check the specifications. 
and, and look at our instruction manual, we require that the pump be grouted. And if someone says, oh, that's too complicated, it's very simple. You just buy the grouts, pre-mixed, you add water, you mix it up in a pail in accordance with the instructions on the bag, you pour it in there, and you're done. No more sophisticated than that. Boom. Done. Boom. Done. So here's a seal. And you've probably seen these seals, and they squeal. Well, <laughs> if you see them on the beach and they squeal, that's fine. But you don't want a pump to squeal. A seal on a pump. If a pump seal is squealing, how do you say that three times fast? Yeah, no, no, no. A pump seal is squealing. If a pump seal is squealing, then chances are the the seal has been destroyed already. It's because it's probably not getting proper lubrication or it's overheating. Either way, the seal has is, is been destroyed because seals are, for all practical purposes, silent. So if you hear a squealing noise, it's not from your friendly uh, mammal that swims around in the ocean. It's usually because the seal has destroyed itself. So how do they destroy themselves? Well, this uh, little picture here of the seal is one that's disassembled. This is the stationary part of the seal. And this part rubs on this little guy right there. And if the pump is operating at the proper temperature and pressure differential and speed, then the fluid that the pump is pumping will, in fact, lubricate the seal between the stationary part that's fixed and the rotating part. And it'll keep it nice and quiet, nice and cool, nice and lubricated. And if you hear it squealing, and that means that the seal has somehow destroyed itself for a variety number of reasons. Um, here is the uh, uh, rotating part. It's actually can't see. That arrow is pointing to the wrong thing, Brett. That's a mistake. <laughs> Let me fix that. Can I fix that? Yes, I can. You can fix it. Uh, it should be this guy here. This one should be pointing to the black part way down there. That's the rotating part. Hey, look at how quick I fixed that. Isn't that amazing? Man, man. Man, I tell you, we're really You're good. just showing off. Right? Now we're you're showing. just showing off. Did we lose our audience, Brett? Does anybody oh, have any questions? We, we're, we're, down to, we're down a little bit. We're down to 39 folks. We're, we're getting down there. Do we have any questions for anybody? No. Because we have a few more things to touch base on that we promised we'd cover. Pretty quiet right now in the question front. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about uh, expansion tanks and... For well, the purposes of this discussion, we're really interested in what are the tips uh, for uh, troubleshooting an expansion tank. Well, the, the biggest one is to make sure that the pre-charge pressure is proper. What do we mean by pre-charge? Well, an expansion tank, in this case, this is called a full bladder style expansion tank. That's the one I'm showed here. It's a bladder style, full acceptance, I, meant, I said the word full bladder. What I meant to say was bladder style, full acceptance expansion tank. And uh, let's assume that the steel container for a moment is 200 gallons. I'll just write that up here, 200 gallons. What's inside the bladder is water, and what's between the bladder and the steel container is an airspace right there. And when we ship these expansion tanks from the factory, the air side is precharged to 12 pounds. I'm going to put a big 12. We precharge that pressure to 12 pounds per square inch gauge. So when the uh, when the expansion tank is shipped from the factory, we precharge the air side to 12 pounds. There's a Schrader valve. You can't see it on this one. It's usually located over here on the side like this. Schrader valve. Um, we add compressed air. Whoops, we add compressed air to the Schrader valve and we pump it up to 12 pounds. Now, let's assume that it left the factory. It's not always going to be this way, but let's assume it left the factory at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. When it reaches its destination and that destination temperature is 70 degrees Fahrenheit, the pressure on the air side should still be 12 pounds. If it's, say, something like at the same temperature, that it left the factory at. If for some reason, for example, uh, let's just say it's four pounds, then it has developed a leak because it should not be less than 12 pounds. 
So if the pressure is less, then you need to check for a leak. And typically, where does it leak? Well, for this style tank, it's usually around the flange connection here, or there's a plug in the bottom of the steel container right down here. And if there's a leak, it's usually in one of those two places. So I'm gonna ask the audience, what's the simplest way in the world to find a leak on an expansion tank? Drum roll, please. <laughs> Anybody come up with the answer? We'll see. We'll see. It's Everybody getting late. Getting late for questions. Getting late. Yep. Soap bubble. Jim says soap bubble. Yes, soap. Get uh, get a paintbrush and go down to your uh, local uh, uh, CVS or wherever the hell you're going to go to a supermarket and pick up a little tiny bottle of uh, I like Dawn dishwashing liquid. <laughs> Dawn makes beautiful bubbles. You take a little Dawn, you put it in a small uh, container, a little bucket uh, of water, you mix it up, you get your paintbrush, you put it on the plug at the bottom, and you put it around the flange at the top, and if you've got a leak, it's going to show up there. Isn't that exciting? I know it is. I, I love this stuff. This is great stuff. These are okay. bonus. This is bonus stuff. This is bonus material. Uh, let's see. Do's and don'ts. Do's and don'ts. Some more tips. When it uh, do precharge the tank before connecting it to the system. So if you figure out, which we cover in a separate uh, presentation, I'm not going to go through it tonight. If you determine that the precharge should be say 50 pounds, that's the air side precharge, then you have to add 50 pounds of pressure on the air side of the expansion tank before you connect it to the system. Remember, we ship the tank with 12 pounds. And if the system requires 50 pounds, you have to pre-charge it before you connect it to the system. Pressure test for leaks before connecting. We told you about uh, that. Do not remove the plug and replace with a valve. There's a plug at the bottom of the expansion tank. Uh, there are plugs on the side over here. These are all in the air side. Do not remove these plugs. And if you have a plug at the bottom, some people actually would remove the plug and they would put in a, uh, a valve so that they could, uh, if they wanted to get the air out of the tank, they would open the valve, or if the bladder failed, they wanted to drain the tank. The problem is that valves will have air leaks, and then if the valve it leaks through the, if the, yeah, here we go again, I'm tripping over my words. The air will leak through the stem of the valve, and if that happens, the tank, expansion tank will become waterlogged. So um, make sure that, that we do not remove the plug and put in a, a, a valve. Do not. It's in our instruction manual too. And do not connect the expansion tank before pre-charging it. Do's and don'ts. More tips. That's it. Brett, we're at the end of our, uh, our bonus material. And it's only 841. Not bad. Not Down bad. To 38 attendees. A lot of thank yous for, from people. Just so you know, Rich, uh, a great job, Scott says. Thank you. Uh, before people signed off, uh, uh, OFAT had to leave, so she uh, she left, but she said thanks and have a happy holidays. Um, uh, and uh, anyways, no more questions. Well, at this point, I'm going to say thanks so much for joining us on Takeo After Dark. Hopefully, you got something uh, out of our troubleshooting tech tips and plus our bonus material. And with that, I'm going to say good night. Turn it over to Brett. Brett, take it away. Hey, uh, Rich, one more. One more. Tip. One okay. more tip. Stay calm when you're troubleshooting. Stay calm. Oh, yeah. That's Home. a great. Yeah. S stay calm. Stay calm. Stay calm. Stay calm. <laughs> Sometimes things get elevated because you're under pressure. Stay yeah, calm. Yeah, there's, there's a new Star Trek series out called uh, Discovery. I, have you watched that, Brett? Uh, not yet, no. It's on uh, it's on Paramount TV. It's a paid uh, paid channel. So anyway, uh, yeah, they they're flying around in their spaceship and like uh, this is like a nonstop. Every five seconds, they're winding up with some kind of disaster. <laughs> and they don't stay calm. If they yeah. just stayed calm, they probably could deal with this stuff. There you go.
As usual, Rich, great job. Uh, the a couple of people uh, commented on your enthusiasm. Um, fantastic. Uh, uh, pat yourself on the back. As I have said more than once to many of you, uh, Rich is very, very knowledgeable when it comes to this stuff, and he he thoroughly enjoys numbers. He thoroughly enjoys numbers. So you know what my number mind. favorite number is this week? No. Seven. 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 Okay. No Pearl Harbor Day? No. Well, no, it's just that the bank called the other day and said, can you give me your account number? And I said, seven. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, we're signing off. Thanks for your time. Uh, look look for your uh, emails tomorrow. Recording, blah, 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 blah. You know you know the drill. Uh, we'll, we, I'm sure we'll be back together after uh, the holidays. Take care, all. Thank you. Bye. Good night.